Newlyweds Joseph and Olga Connell were three months into their marriage. Things were good. They were successful and their only concerns were small, family things, petty things. Nothing serious. My neighbor is laying on the ground. She's a her. She has blood all over her body. Joseph Connell was the middle of three children. John, his older brother, and Kelly, his younger sister. They grew up in a caring household, and although their parents divorced, they stayed civil, and there was still plenty of love within their family. Joseph grew up to be the fun guy. For some, he was a little obnoxious, but to most, he was able to bring a smile to anyone's face. He had a light-hearted attitude and a passion for enjoying life. As an adult, Joseph started CNS Auto Service with his good friend Christopher Rivers. Olga was originally from Russia. She had been married before, but had an amicable split from her ex-husband, who she and actually Joseph were still on good terms with. Olga and Joseph hit it off right away. Olga got along with his family, and they all welcomed her with open arms. They seemed like the ideal couple, and marriage was the logical next step. The concept of marriage brought along its own bit of drama for the Connells, and not just regular expected drama that comes with a wedding. Mickey. Joseph's mother had given Kelly, her only daughter, her wedding ring, the one that she wore when she was married to their father. She gave Kelly the ring as it had always been promised to her, and it was a very generous gift, considering that it was worth twenty thousand dollars. But after Olga and Joseph got engaged, Mickey actually took the ring back. She told Kelly that she wanted to borrow the ring to wear on a trip to Mexico, but then she actually gave the ring to Joseph. It was apparently very common knowledge that Joseph was her favorite. Kelly found out about the ring and was, of course, very upset and demanded that Joseph give it back, which he did, but not before he and his mother had the diamonds removed and replaced with cubic zirconia. He took the real diamonds and put them on a new ring that he gave to Olga and returned the original ring back to Kelly. Mickey said that Joey needed the ring and not Kelly, and she was sorry that she gave it to her in the first place. Kelly was able to immediately notice that the diamonds on the ring were changed, and that the ring given back to her was not the same. It's easy to understand why Kelly would be upset. This was a shady move by both her brother and mother, and probably insulting that neither one of them thought that she would notice. I'm sure that there were other, more mature ways that they could have worked around the ring situation, but instead they tried to trick her and chose to be deceptive. Joseph and his mother put the entire ring debacle behind them and moved on with their lives, not really worried about Kelly's feelings in the situation. Joseph and Kelly's relationship gets rocky after this, but it seems that Joseph was fine with that. He had bigger things on his mind at the moment. Olga was not even aware of the situation, so she was obviously very ecstatic about the ring and gung ho about her wedding. Olga and Joseph go on to get married in the Virgin Islands with a small group of loved ones. It was a beautiful wedding, and they looked incredibly happy together. They were ready to start their lives together. Kelly wasn't there. She was still hurt about the whole altercation, which is completely understandable. Olga occasionally was caught in the crosshairs when Kelly would send her mean texts, but for the most part, Olga stayed out of it. It was mainly between Joseph and Kelly. But when Kelly sent Olga some of these nasty texts on the day of her wedding, Joseph was furious. He was pretty protective of Olga, and he didn't want this ruining her big day. It's safe to say that this created an ugly rift between the siblings, and Joseph and Kelly just never actually sat down to fix it. This ugly back and forth between Joey and Kelly continued, and they even went as far as to get restraining orders and orders of protection. Aside from this, things were going well for Joseph. He just married a wonderful woman, and his business was thriving. Olga actually became the receptionist at the auto shop, and she spent most of her days there, which is what they wanted. They loved spending time together, and they didn't mind being together at home and also at work. Shortly after their wedding, Joseph and Olga's home was broken into. A few of Olga's items, like her jewelry and family heirlooms, were missing, but not her engagement ring, because of course she was wearing it the day of the break-in. They called the police and made a report. 
and it was clear that they had an idea of who they thought may have broken into their house, but that was just speculation, and there was only so much that they could do. Three months later, on September 22nd, it was Olga's 39th birthday. Joseph and Olga had gone out to celebrate. They were returning home for the night, and as they put the key into the lock, gunshots were fired. 911, what's the address of your emergency? My neighbor, she's laying on the ground. Obviously, she's hurt. Okay. Blood all over her face. She's just laying there now? Yeah, she's laying on the ground. Their neighbors heard the gunshots and found Olga lying on the steps of her condo covered in blood. When the ambulance arrived, she was still alive, but sadly she wouldn't make it to the hospital. Joseph was found in the front yard of their home in the bushes, shot in the back of the head. He was shot a total of nine times. The neighbors didn't see anything or anyone, but they did hear a few things. They heard the voices of two men, a scuffle, and then multiple shots fired, over 20. But nothing was taken. All of their belongings were still there. Joseph's wallet, Olga's purse, and even her ring was still on her finger. Newcastle County Police are trying to figure out who killed a well-known business owner and his new wife. It all happened late Saturday night in the Paladin Club Apartments in Wilmington. NBC10 Delaware Bureau Chief Tim Furlong spoke to friends of the victim and police about the killings. Olga didn't have much family around, but the friends that she did have all seemed to love her. Some people tried to start up rumors about her Russian roots and how that could be the reason for their deaths, but it was all a rumor and nothing came from it after proper investigation. So they changed directions in the investigation and focused more on Joseph's relations. Did he have any enemies at work? Did he mention anything to a friend? Had he recently screwed anyone over? The police interviewed family and friends where they learned about Joseph's history. In fact, Joseph's business partner, Chris Rivers, was supposed to be with the couple the night that they were killed. But before they went into the bar, he realized that he left his ID at home and just decided to turn in for the night instead of driving home and then back again. He actually had no idea what had happened to the couple when he was taken into the interrogation room. I asked him, do you own a business with uh, Joe Connell? His response was, what, what did he do now? I just want to talk to you a little bit about your partner, uh, your history with him, and uh, what kind of stuff he's got himself tangled up in recently. Also, when we're all said that, I promise me you won't repeat it to him. Yes. So I told the other. Give me my word. Okay. At 11, I went down there. It was around, I guess it was around 10.30. But I didn't have my idea on me, so I had to drive all the way home. Oh, my God. <laughs> he thought that Joseph had gotten into another brawl while at the bar. Joseph had a little history of getting into trouble. Before he had met Olga, he got into a fight at a bar, and in his rage mixed with how drunk he was, he went to his car and pulled out a shotgun. Luckily, the police arrived before he made it back to the bar to do who knows what, and he was arrested then and there. Although the shotgun was unloaded and he was probably using it for intimidation, he spent seven years in jail. After he served his time in prison, his friends and family said that they saw a lot of changes in him. He was more responsible and relaxed, and he had not only grown mentally, but also physically. It was rumored that the connections that he made in jail may have followed him after he was released. From the outside, it looked like Joseph always seemed to have more money than the auto store alone could provide him. And those rumors were proved to be true. It turns out that Joseph developed an addiction while he was in jail. He was not only using but selling steroids as a side hustle, and it was causing some trouble, not just for him, but for his partner as well. Finally, I, was, I wasn't there one day, and the guy, the other guy that works for me, comes up to me and goes, 
was just selling drugs out of the back of the shop. And I was like, well, what? So I searched the shop, found them, and said to them, get them out. I don't want it here. I'm not losing the freaking place over this. What was he selling? Steroids. Seemed pretty convinced that's what this is all about. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's probably what it's about. Mm -hmm. Why would you say that? Well, what else would it be about? So investigators had to be on alert that there was a possibility that Joseph's side hustle could have resulted in an unhappy client seeking revenge. And of course, there was that break in a few months earlier. Could that have had anything to do with it? Is there anybody that might want to hurt him now? I don't know. Was it the plane about having problems with anyone? Mark Twain. Hey. Did you tell him about the robbery? No. 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 So obviously, Joseph had more than considered that his sister was the culprit in the break-in, but neither he nor anyone else in his family felt the need to take that suspicion any further. Was Ring really worth all that effort? In his mind, if the robbery was Kelly, she was trying to scare them and to get her point across, which she did. And now it was over. That was probably as extreme as it was going to get. I mean, you can only hold on to grudges for so long. Although it had only been a few months. But come on, who would go to such extremes over a ring? For the police, Kelly was their number one suspect. But the ring, the source of all her anger, it wasn't even taken. So why would she kill for something that she wouldn't even end up with in the end? Also, the neighbors were pretty adamant that it was two men at the Connell home that night. So where was Kelly when it all happened? She stated that she had undergone cancer treatment that day and that she was at home recovering from it. But it doesn't necessarily rule her out completely. She had a motive, and she and Joseph were clearly not on good terms. Kelly cooperated with the police and was pretty open and honest about her and Joseph's current feud. Tell me about your brother. Plus, she was able to confirm that Joseph's side hustle had caused some trouble and that it was worth looking into. I would have to guess that robbery and murder are connected by some kind of drug people. Yes, steroids are illegal, but they aren't necessarily a hard drug that people kill over. Maybe it was the money. At this point, the police had multiple motives and leads, but nothing solid. Opinions were split, as well as the Connell family. Was it Kelly? Was it a bad business deal? Was it a crime of opportunity? And after a few months, they just kept hitting dead ends. 
any traction on this case was slowly fading away until a local media outlet decided to conduct some interviews on the case to post on their website. There's nothing that he would ever do to make anybody angry, ever. Um, he met Olga at Bellevue State Park for the first time. I believe they met over the internet. Now, did he have a lot of money? Jeff? I don't know. I mean, when, but did he have to buy into the business or anything? Or? Um, I'd rather not get into that, but yeah. He did have to buy into the business? Not a large amount. I'm not going to talk about that. All right. How was your relationship up to the day he died? Figures you see somebody every day, 12 hours a day, more than you see your wife. So we were pretty much best friends. When was the last thing you did together? When was the last time you saw him? Well, I was together Friday with him. And then Saturday I was supposed to meet him down with everybody at the bar. So you, you worked on Friday. Mm-hmm. Olga's working too, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's happy. And Everything's then, fine. Normal day. What bar were you, and you're supposed to meet him Saturday? Saturday at Firestone with a bunch of friends. Firestone's down the Is that down Riverfront. the front? But this didn't happen until Sunday, right? From what I'm told. So what happened? why didn't you meet on Saturday? I was work. Oh, so you just couldn't go? Mm-hmm. So they we had plans there. to go, but I never made it. And you talk to you just call them and say, hey, man, I, I can't get there. Text yeah, them, so I was talking to them. I talked to them all day long. And would you go fishing with them and stuff? Mm -hmm. And you really consider them your best friend? One of me. I found out around 9.30 or 10.30 Sunday morning. They came and knocked on your door? They woke me up at 6 a.m., 6.30. Yeah. Now, where were you the night before? At Did home. You? At work, to the shop, to home. Did you do anything that night? Did you go out anywhere? Or? I was at work, and then I went straight home. What did you guys do that night? Went to bed. Oh, you didn't go straight home. I went to, yeah. I went to McDonald's and brought food home to her. You guys watch a movie, hang out? I mean, I don't want to get into... It. Ate food and went to bed. <laughs> oh, you went to bed early? Mm hmm Oh, wait a minute. You well, early. it was early as, like, 12 o'clock. So midnight. Yeah. Never left the house. She never left the house? Nope. Usually Sunday I just lay around the house. Watch football? Or... Mm hmm Instead you got woken by the Newcastle County Police detectives at 6 a.m.? Yep. How'd they tell you he was killed? How, how did, what was that? They didn't at first. They asked me a bunch of questions and I had no clue why I was there. And... They wouldn't tell you? No. Why'd you go with them? I figured it but had something to do with I don't know I just went <laughs> I've never been in trouble before I just kind of went along with what they said what did they say to, what did they say they just said I need to come down to Newcastle County and talk to them this specific interview had a few moments that contradicted Chris's original interview with the police here he mentions that he went straight home from work after a stop at McDonald's but in the original interview he says that he was supposed to go out with Olga and Joseph but when he got to the bar, he realized he forgot his wallet. He also had no problem mentioning Joey's steroid business and addiction to the police, but now he's refusing to say anything that sheds a bad light on Joey. But the reason behind that could be simple. It's completely normal for people not to want to speak ill of the dead. Like I mentioned earlier, from the outside, Joseph and Olga seem to be living above their means. And although we know now that Joseph was selling and using steroids, it was also suspected that he was embezzling from the company, that he was pocketing large amounts of money and keeping it from his business and business partner. Chris would complain about Joe uh, taking money out of the account um, for uh, like lavish things, like luxurious things. I've always heard it from Chris's side that, you know, Joe's doing this, Joe's doing that. Upon further investigation, even though the books were showing over a million in income yearly, somehow the auto store was indeed losing money. And it was confirmed, money was being embezzled from the company, but not from Joseph. Chris had a drug problem of his own. He was addicted to prescription drugs and cocaine, and his addiction ran deep. But his pockets? Not so much. Chris was stealing money from the auto store to maintain his addiction, but it wasn't enough. He had silently brought in another partner named Harry Cook, who had invested over $140,000 into the auto shop, and Joey had no idea. 
Harry was expecting to have some sort of partnership or ownership of CNS Auto with Chris, but Chris already had a partner who has shown no intention of leaving. Chris had found himself in an extraordinary amount of debt. He had no way to pay it off and he was bound to be caught. As much as Chris liked to claim that he and Joseph were best friends, this was not the case. Once the investigators found out about Chris's drug addiction, they learned from his ex-drug dealer that Chris loathed Joseph, and he was jealous of his lifestyle. Despite what Chris had said in the interview, behind Joey's back, Chris was constantly complaining and bad-mouthing Joey. So they looked further into his whereabouts the night of September 22nd. Chris had earlier voluntarily told the investigators that he had cameras inside and outside of his house. And sure enough, they were able to confirm from the security cameras that Chris was home the night of the murders. Oddly enough, he actually seemed to be pacing back and forth in front of these cameras a lot. It almost seemed purposeful. On top of that, he was making a lot of phone calls and text messages, but when the police looked at his phone history that night, Suspiciously, they had all been manually deleted. They promptly went to his phone records and saw that he had been in constant contact with his current drug dealer, Joshua Bay, a regular at CNS Auto. Could Chris and Josh Bay have been talking about more than just drug deals that night? Could Josh have been one of the men outside of Olga and Joey's condo? They looked further into Josh and investigators were able to quickly rule him out as the murderer by surveillance cameras that had shown that he had been working that night. But, while assessing Josh's phone, they noticed more text messages that had been mysteriously deleted. That night, he had been communicating back and forth with two men named Dominic Benson and Aaron Thompson. All of a sudden, these men were always talking to each other but at the same time, their messages were conveniently erased or lost. Something just wasn't sitting right and the police kept digging. The deeper they got, it was beginning to look like a murder for hire. Police were able to hold Josh Bay on a parole violation. Surprisingly, both Dominic and Aaron showed up to his hearing, sitting on opposite sides of the courtroom, as if to intimidate but also make sure that nothing that didn't need to be said was said. Investigators would question Josh, but he said nothing. About a year after the murders, the police were starting to put two and two together, and Joshua could sense it. Investigators interrogated Joshua once again with the new evidence that they had accumulated, but this time offered Joshua a deal if he cooperated with them. It wasn't until a story came out about the amount of debt that Chris Rivers was in that Josh started feeling enough pressure to accept a plea deal for his involvement and he confirmed the investigator's suspicions towards Chris. Hypothetically, if one were to hire a hitman and then the hitman finds out that one, you never intended to pay and two, you don't even have the means to pay, the hitman or men may start to get angry. Josh was the middleman and he was feeling pressure from both the cops and Dominic and Aaron, so his best option was to look out for himself. Joshua allegedly stated that Chris had hired him to perform the robbery in the Connells' homes months before their deaths to put suspicions onto Kelly, Joseph's sister, so that when the two were found murdered, she would become the main suspect. And it worked. For a while. Chris needed a way to pay for his debt and his addiction. He found more use out of Joseph dead than alive. Since they were co-owners of the auto store, they had taken out insurance on each other in case anything were to happen to one of them. The other would use the insurance money to pay the payments on the auto shop. And the insurance payout was right around $1 million. But since Joseph had just married Olga, Chris thought that Joey may have put Olga in his will, making him the secondary beneficiary. And in order for him to receive all the money, he needed Olga to die as well. He hired Joshua Bay to either kill or find someone to kill Joseph and Olga for $60,000. We'll start with uh, how you met Chris, and then we'll work through from there. Does that work? Okay. So you like, um, yeah. I'll pay anything, like I'll pay anything, um, 
to keep them out the way, keep them going. So I threw the number out there, probably about, I said, man, it's 50,000. He said, I can do 50,000. Did Chris ever call you and say, I changed my mind, I don't want to do this? You know, uh, no. Mm-hmm. What, I take it from the conversations we had that it's been just the opposite. Yeah. Hurry up. Persistent. Yeah, real persistent. Real persistent. Joshua hired Dominic Benson and Aaron Thompson. It is believed that Aaron was the one who pulled the trigger that night. Chris paid Josh a $5,000 down payment and then made multiple payments adding up to $9,000 after the murders, in which Josh gave $5,000 to Aaron and $4,000 to Dominic. Nowhere near the $60,000 they had agreed to. Not long after Josh's confession, investigators had gathered enough evidence and finally, Chris was arrested for conspiracy and two charges of murder. Chris's trial was over a year later and he was convicted with two consecutive life sentences along with another 50 years for conspiracy to commit murders. Aaron Thompson was convicted with two recurring life sentences as the hitman of the murders and an additional 45 years for weapon possession and conspiracy to commit murder. Dominic was sentenced to five years for conspiracy to commit murder and Joshua Bay was sentenced to five years due to the fact that he had accepted a deal with the investigators for cooperating. You know, I just remember crying when he said guilty. That was the first time in trial I cried. I just, when he said guilty, held myself together till that point. <laughs> with all the twists, turns, and manipulation in this case, it's possible to have never known the truth. Chris may have gotten away with it and a family could have gone a lifetime never knowing or firmly believing that it was someone else, their own family member. This family could have easily been torn apart even further than it already has. It's heartbreaking to see the result of addiction and jealousy. Make up. Make up. Don't go to bed mad. <laughs> Tell people you love them. Uh, I learn, learn the hard way. You don't get a... You can't expect the next day. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to show your support, and we'll see you in the next one.